Hello, Bookstew viewers and listeners. So way back in 2014, when Bookstew started, some of my early episodes featured local men who read. And I decided to put those three men on first because I wanted to dissuade people who always said, oh, men don't read anything. Men play sports, men don't read. Men. And I thought that was really wrong if they were not reading, there was had to be a reason for it, and if they did read, what did they like to read? So um, my guest today kind of follows along in my path because he started a book club just for men. I'm so happy to introduce you to Andy Wolverton today. Andy is speaking to us from Zaverna Park, Maryland. Andy, what made you a reader? That's a good question, because as a kid growing up, I was really more into watching TV and watching movies and not so much reading. And there was a book fair at my school when I was probably eight, nine years old, and they had books that you could you could buy. And some of these were novelizations of movies that I'd seen, a lot of Disney movies like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang or a movie like Born Free. And I got the books, but I didn't read them for a while, for a long time. But when I finally did read them, I noticed there are some differences between what's in this book and what I saw. So that was quite a lesson for me to, to learn. And so, um, you know, that, that could be, I could make a, every book stew about the differences between movies and books and which is better and I think that is one of the most fun exercises um, a reader and a moviegoer can indulge in but you have evolved to become a professional reader in a way why don't you tell us about your job well my job at the library is one that I had always dreamed of having even when I was teaching and I was a teacher for 15 years 13 of those were in middle school, teaching middle school kids. But I was always reading, especially after I got out of college and I had time to read, and I got interested in a lot of different types of reading, not only things I gravitated to normally like science fiction, uh, horror, and other things, but history, biography, and things like that. And I found I had time to do that. So when I became a librarian and started talking to people at the information desk, and I would talk to women, and I would ask them a totally inappropriate question. What's your husband reading? <laughs> Not that I inappropriate, know. but. Totally inappropriate. <laughs> I, I had a meeting with my supervisor, you know, she straightened me out. But, but the thing I would hear more often than not was men don't read. And I knew that wasn't right because I would see men coming into the library, checking books out. And I thought maybe they're checking them out for somebody else, but they're still checking them out. But then they started coming to the desk and telling me what they were reading, and they wanted to know what I was reading. So I knew there were men out there, maybe not a lot, but there were men who read, and that's how I started the book club, based on that, that notion to show people that, yes, men do read, and they like to get together, and they like to talk about what they read. All right, so I'm just going to pop a statistic in here from your book, and your book is called Men Don't Read, which is kind of, <laughs> it should maybe should be men do read or men will read sometimes or uh, men like to read but they don't like to talk about it. But um, I understand the reason for the title, but in your book you say there are five million book clubs in the United States, which is pretty amazing, and 90% of them are all women. So I happen to be in a book club called Potluck Book Club, which tells you what the emphasis is on. It's, it's food, we'll admit it, but we have, um, out of nine members, we have two men in the book club. And I'm so glad that we do, because I think that um, they read different books than most of the women read. So let's talk about the origins of your book club and, and how you took that brave leap to start a men's book club? Well, at first it was very difficult. I had, it took several months to get guys to actually come to the meeting. And if anyone reads the book, they'll see what those first couple of meetings were like. And it took the third meeting before things really caught on. 
And it took even longer for me to understand what they wanted to read. And generally, they wanted to read biographies, they wanted to read military history, American history, and that was it. So it took a while before for that to develop. For those first few years, I let them, um, in fact, I didn't let them choose any books, which was probably, I don't know, I might do it differently, but, but I knew what they wanted and I kept giving them pretty much what they wanted. And then later on, I let them choose. And I found some really interesting things developing once I let them start to choose. So now you have a balance between you choose. So your, you, the men's book club meets every month, except maybe July. And um, you, you alternate between you choosing the book and them choosing the book. And they put up a list of suggestions. And then the men vote on it. Right, right. That's exactly right. Uh, we, I took the month of July off. I did, but they didn't. They kept meeting. My wife was in the Navy, and July was the block leave, so that was the only time we had to go on vacation. So I would take July off, but one of the members would lead, so it, the group kept going. But that's exactly what we still do. I pick one, they pick one. And when I pick one, I try to pick something with a subject that I know they're going to like, but it may be from a different voice. For example, we picked, or I picked, uh, The Sympathizer, which is told from a Vietnamese point of view, which they'd never read a book written in a Vietnamese point of view before. Also one called Kindred by Octavia Butler. It's a science fiction novel set in Maryland, so it's local, and it's by an African-American woman. And that's not a voice that they typically read. But they read both of those books, and they enjoyed them. And the greatest compliment I can receive is when we're done with a discussion and someone comes up and they, they will say, I would not have picked this book on my own, but I'm glad I did. I'm glad that's, I read it. That's, uh, that happens in our book club, too. And we've also found that the books that everyone dislikes the most engender the best discussions. <laughs> mm. But right. <laughs> um, I wanted to mention some other, another interesting uh, part of your book that, um, that you, that you, well, you claim here that boys are taught that reading is not a cool activity for boys. And I thought that was so sad based on, I'm also a reading tutor in the Boston Public Schools and you know we tutor about half girls and half boys. And on their uh, first, second, third graders, I don't, I don't find that to be so. But I know that if I'm gonna, for the older kids, if I'm gonna get a sports book, that's really gonna grab them. Where if I, um, if I just do fiction and a story, they don't seem to be as motivated and interested. And you did say that you thought it was because the way, whether it's the way boys are raised or whether they are naturally. Their, um, their enjoyment is more in movement and in motion, where girls are not necessarily taught that way traditionally, and so they're more content to, to settle down and read. Did you ever talk to any of the men in your book club about you know, their reading lives and how they came to read? I did, and some of them gave me some very interesting anecdotes about their fathers helping them to develop as a reader from a very young age. I would hear that story from time to time, not a lot, but most of the men in the book club developed the habit of reading later in life like I did uh, after college and for various reasons. But you bring up a great point because, and again, there, there are a lot of generalizations out there that you know boys typically like to read nonfiction and girls like to read fiction. It's a generalization, but there's some truth to it. But what I found is boys generally want to read something that has importance or validity to them right now. Wow. Hmm. Like, how can I put something together? How can I build this great structure? How can I run faster? How can I score more touchdowns? They want something that's very practical that they can use now. They don't typically see any benefit in something they might use in the future. And fiction is a particularly tough sell for those guys 
unless they see themselves in those books. So that's one reason why they like sports stories, uh, you know, books about uh, people that are inventors that do something, that build something. So that's kind of what is ingrained in them to some degree. And again, those are generalizations. So um, I would like you to read a passage from your book that I found particularly enjoyable because um, one of the, some of the best parts of the book are your successes, but also, you know, problems that you had and barriers and resistance. So, um, and also about how to handle uh, members of the book club that um, maybe are not, uh, not as uh, helpful members as some of the others. So why don't you tell us the story of one of those guys? Sure, I'd be glad to. So this is a, a, an account of when we were reading as a book club, uh, the Bill Bryson book, A Walk in the Woods, about Bryson and the Appalachian Trail and his adventures there. And so the guys were making comments on the books, sharing their experiences. And everything went really, really well until a new guy started to speak. He'd never been to the book club before. And I'll call him Ed. So here's a part from the book. Ed was a large man, but not fat. A big guy who looked like he could have once played linebacker for a good college football team. Maybe even pro. A man in his early 40, mid-40s or early 50s, still in good shape. He sat near the door at the end of the table, almost as far away from my seat as you could get. After the discussion had been going for a good 15 or 20 minutes, Ed began relating a story about one of his own hikes. Now understand that Ed didn't start this travelogue by announcing that he was undertaking an anecdote or a story, and certainly not an epic tale of Homeric proportions. He just started talking, and he kept talking and talking, and talking, relating the microscopic details of one of his hikes, including his surroundings, what he had packed, the weather conditions, barometric pressure, <laughs> you name it. Throughout his tale, Ed's eyes never met those of any of the other guys. Instead, he focused on the table, the ceiling, anywhere but the faces of the other guys in the room. He was in his own little world and was clearly holding court. Maybe this was the first time he'd ever told his story, or perhaps he felt it was the appropriate audience. I began to think maybe I should either call the Guinness Book of World Records or the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, because this guy didn't pause for a single breath in what seemed like 10 minutes. There was literally no way to get a word in because of Ed's hiking manifesto was an enormous stream of consciousness sentence worthy of James Joyce, <laughs> one that seemed as if it was never going to end. So I looked around the room thinking, maybe it's just me. Maybe this isn't going on as long as I think it is. Initially, I saw guys watching Ed, listening attentively, respectfully, and there were no anxious looks on their faces, so maybe it was just me. And the story kept going, with Ed showing no signs of flagging. This wasn't a story. This was its own multi-volume travelogue, and we were on <laughs> perhaps page seven or eight of what I feared would be the war and peace of hiking stories. Looking around, I noticed other guys were now starting to fidget, rubbing their chins, looking at their phones, looking at me. I knew I had to do something. I always wanted the guys to be able to speak freely, but this was getting ridiculous, approaching filibuster territory. But how could I stop this guy without being rude? It was Ed's first time with the group, and while I certainly wanted him to have his turn, I had to let him know that this was a group that allows everyone who wants to talk an opportunity to do so. He clearly wasn't allowing anyone else to do that. Maybe it was just an honest mistake, or maybe he was a blowhard who just didn't care. I didn't know, but I knew I had to do something fast. How long this went on, I can't be sure, but I finally interrupted Ed in mid-sentence. Ed, that's a great story, but I'm going to have to stop you for a moment because I think we've got some other guys who want to comment. In that moment, I prayed there would be somebody <laughs> besides Ed who had a comment to make. Anyone, 
he would deliver us from this never-ending story. I waited for what seemed an hour for some brave soul to rescue us all. Thankfully, someone did. I can't remember who it was, but that guy has my everlasting gratitude. <laughs> what this guy said was something along the lines of, I want to mention a part of the book that connected with me, and then he related it. Waves of relief flooded over me. Other than walking into an empty cell on a tour of Alcatraz, I've never been in prison, but it felt like a cell had been opened and I'd been set free. The first thing I did after exhaling was to look at Ed. He seemed a little perturbed, as if someone had just unplugged his electric shaver before he could finish shaving. <laughs> Ed wasn't looking at the guy who was speaking, but rather down at the table, scowling. With his mouth closed, he began silently moving his lips as if he were still talking or practicing for the next time he'd be allowed to speak. Concern grew in me that this was just a temporary reprieve that, Lord help us all, his previous recitation had only been part one, or even worse, a prelude to part one. <laughs> My thankfulness for those guys who stepped in with comments is endless. Again, I wish I could remember who they were. I'd give each of them a medal of valor. They truly kept the meeting from going completely off the rails, and they did it with class. And then Ed started speaking again. But something was different this time. A bit of the bravado was missing, although some of it clearly remained, and I can't remember if he continued from where he'd left off in his previous story or if it was a new adventure. But like his first contribution, it had nothing to do with the book, but rather his own hiking experiences. This time, however, the longer he spoke, the less conviction his tale carried. Mm -hmm. He was on autopilot, but low on fuel. True, he had lost a lot of altitude and perhaps was looking for one long distant runway, but he still had some gas left in the tank. Something in the way he spoke told me he was defeated. Ed seemed to want to keep going and going, but yet he didn't have the same amount of vigor. This time, all I had to do was to look around the room and find just one guy who was willing to make contact with me. I found one guy that made eye contact. Again, I can't remember who it was, but Let's say it was a guy named John. And as soon as I saw John's eyes, I simply said, John, you've got something? And John did. And that was it for Ed. He was done. Throughout the rest of the meeting, he remained completely silent. The other guys continued discussing the book normally, and it appeared as if everyone was back to having a good time, except for Ed. I didn't see this as an I win, you lose situation. I simply wanted other guys to have the opportunity to speak. Although those minutes had been uncomfortable, I didn't have anything personal against Ed. He seemed like an okay guy. Maybe he just enjoyed talking about himself. Lots of people do. Maybe he was the type of guy no one paid attention to at home or at work. Maybe all he needed was the opportunity to talk. Giving him that opportunity was fine, but only to a point. I had other guys in the room who also deserved that opportunity, and to allow him to continue to dominate the conversation, regardless of the reason, was unfair to everyone. When the meeting ended, Ed was, if I remember correctly, the first one to leave. The sense of relief that I had that the meeting hadn't been a total loss gave way to something deeper. I wondered if Ed was simply seeking people to talk to. No, that, that wasn't exactly it. He wasn't conversing with the other guys. He was just relating his own experiences to them, which I suppose could have been his way of interacting with people. As I mentioned earlier, maybe he had nobody else in his life who would listen to him. I felt that maybe I should have said something to him, but I didn't know what that would be. I learned a long time ago as a teacher that when students in my class disobeyed or broke the rules, it probably had nothing to do with me. In many cases, there are problems going on before they ever get to your classroom. It could be they're new students and really don't know the rules yet, or maybe they're just testing the waters to see what the limits are. But sometimes those students aren't breaking the rules just to break the rules. There's something else going on in their lives, something they're they're not sure how to handle. 
Breaking the rules can simply be a way to get attention, but sometimes it's a cry for help. Now, I'm not trying to play armchair psychiatrist here. First of all, I'm not qualified to do so, and second, I wouldn't want the job. Yet sometimes there's something there. I didn't know what might have been going on with Ed, but at the very least, I should have spoken to him and thanked him for coming to the meeting. I don't know, maybe he would have said something, maybe not. I'll never know now. After that meeting, I would see Ed come into the library from time to time. He was always alone, always looked at the displays of new fiction and nonfiction, and never came anywhere close to the information desk. I struggled with whether I should approach him and at least say hello, and I'm sorry to say I never did. Maybe that one bad experience kept me from talking to him, or perhaps my fears got the better of me, keeping me from making that first step that would have led to a better understanding of the guy. I deeply regret not doing so. I decided that in the future I would try to do a better job of seeking to understand problem situations and the people behind them. It was ironic that I could walk up to any guy in the library and start talking about the guy's book club, but hesitated to initiate a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who had made the effort to attend, someone who had stepped out on a limb, maybe even gotten out of his comfort zone and joined us. Even with that problematic meeting, Ed had taken the first step, but I had not taken the next one. Oh, that breaks my heart, but makes me laugh on many, many, many levels. Um, the fact that you're honest enough to, and you do through the book, you mention times when you could have reached out, done something differently, and you didn't do it. But I think this maybe gets into the root of why a lot of men would not join a book club. Maybe they even like to read, but maybe they don't want to discuss. When um, I've been in a book club for over probably 40 years now, and in the beginning, when my best friend and her sister said, we're starting a book club, do you want to join? I, I, they said, we know you read more than anybody else. I said, yeah, but that doesn't mean I want to talk to people about it. Of course, now I have a show where I talk to people about it and this book club that has lasted forever. But in the beginning, I didn't want to share my feelings about the books. So um, that was another fascinating thing I found about your book club that um, it is kind of scary to share your feelings about, about things sometimes. And, and you were able to encourage men to do this. It, it is a scary thing for a lot of guys, and you're right. Um, and in fact, in the book, I talk about one guy who never said anything in any of the meetings, and he kept coming, and he kept coming. And one day, his wife came to the desk and said, oh, my husband's in your book club. He loves it. He can't stop talking about it when he gets home. I have to hear every detail. And I'm like, really? He doesn't really <laughs> seem very engaged in the meetings. And she says, he loves it. He just cannot stop. I have to just tell him to be quiet. So you have those people that, that are engaged, but they, for some reason, they're not willing to contribute. And then you got guys like Ed that just cannot stop. And, and my biggest regret that I, with Ed is I didn't talk to him after the meeting or the next couple of days and say, I'm so glad to have you. Um, but, you know, we want everybody to participate, to gently tell him that. I should have done that. And, but, but you're right. I mean, I think learning from our, our mistakes and admitting our mistakes, you know, maybe this will help someone else in a similar situation. It may not be a book club, but maybe it's a family gathering or a business meeting or something, that this might help somebody else deal with that problem. Speaking of dealing with problems, how did the book club, the guys book club deal with COVID? COVID was a tough time. Um, I'll be honest, we, we didn't know exactly what was going to happen because for several weeks the library was closed. There, were, there was no access to books. So thankfully I had all the guys on my email list and I contacted them and I said, here's an option. Uh, we could go to public domain books that you can, we can read on the internet and we can talk about those. 
which actually worked really well because I'd always wanted us to do more classics. And so this time we were forced to do classics and we met via Zoom and we, uh, we toughed it out. Did you have um, the same, like, I know that after you've been meeting with a bunch of people for a while, you get to identify their characteristics and stuff. Um, did you have the same, do you feel like you had the same level of participation in Zoom? Because, you know, Zoom is, you know, we're all glad we have it, but there's something just so impersonal about it. I guess, you know, you're not in the room with people. Um, they're almost, in a way to me, they're like cardboard figures, you know, cutouts. Was there anything extra that you did to, to kind of, um, to keep the group dynamic going when you weren't seeing each other in person? It was difficult. And some guys from the get-go, when they learned that we were gonna do Zoom discussions, they just flat out said, I won't be joining you. I don't like Zoom. I don't like the very things you brought up, the impersonal nature of it, the, the uh, cardboard you know, characters of it, uh, that, that people don't c come across naturally. And they said, we're just not gonna do it. And there were, there were two or three guys that said that. Eventually they came back and joined us. And those first few conversations were pretty rigid. Uh, people were not being themselves. We still talked about books, but it, it took a while. And some guys, some guys never joined us, but some of the ones that said they wouldn't did. And now we do a hybrid meeting so that we can meet in person. And thanks to a wonderful device called the Meeting Owl, the people that don't live near us anymore, people that have moved away can join us virtually. So it turned out to be a great thing and we were able to keep meeting, uh, but there's nothing like the in-person meetings. Have you gone back to in-person meetings now? We do in-person and virtual at the same time. So how do you balance, um, how do you do that? Because our book club, um, we have one member who lives in Vermont, so when it's her turn, we usually do Zoom, but how do you keep uh, both the live people and the Zooming people engaged? Well, the great thing about it, again, is this uh, device called the Meeting Owl, which is a camera and a microphone. So people around the table at our in-person meeting can speak naturally, and the people connecting on Zoom can speak naturally, and they can jump in at any time, and there's no lag or no noticeable lag. So it's almost like they're in the room with us. It's, it's an incredible device. Many libraries have uh, the Meeting Owl. Uh, it's, it's pretty expensive for a, an individual to buy, but many companies have it and libraries have it, and that's made a huge difference. I'm gonna have to look into that for, for our potluck book group. What book would you say surprised you most about the guy's response to it? Well, there were two, and one of them I talk about in the book when we read Cormac McCarthy's No Country for Old Men. Uh, almost everyone in the group hated it, except for one guy, and I, I don't want to spoil it, so I'm going to have people read the book for that. Uh, another huge surprise for me was one of the first times the guys got to vote on a book or the books that we were going to read. We, we do it by quarter, so we, we pick three books. Sometimes they pick two, sometimes I pick two, depending on how it, the quarter's going. I was stunned that not only did the guys vote for Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, I, I couldn't believe they voted for that. I was delighted because I loved that book. But then when we got to the book, the discussion was just fantastic. And so many of the guys at that meeting said, I don't think I've ever read a book from a woman's point of view before. Uh -huh. Now I think I understand a little something, not only about what it means to be a woman, but to be a woman in Jane Austen's time in Great Britain. And so many of the guys, just it was a game changer for them. They were like, this, this has rocked my world. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is great, but you guys need to read more works by women, clearly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so when you make your recommendations. Let me ask you if you can remember off the top of your head, what are your next few recommendations for the Guys Book Club? Well, I won't talk about the ones that I haven't announced yet, but 
the one that we have coming up next is a novel called Booth about not only John Wilkes Booth, but about his entire family and how he developed. And it's written by one of my favorite authors, Karen Joy Fowler. And this will be the first book by her that we've done. Uh, again, I picked it because it's historical, which they like. Um, John Wilkes Booth, of course, is a notorious character, which they are all familiar with. But they probably have never heard this story told from a woman's point of view. So that so you are trying? Are you trying? You, I assume you're trying to bring in more diverse voices into into your authors. Um, what do the what are inter some interesting ones that the men themselves have chosen lately? They have chosen, let's see, lately we have done, oh boy. Um, we did a book called Cloud Cuckoo Land by uh. Anthony Doerr. Are, are you familiar with that one? <laughs> we, or my book club did. <laughs> we cursed whoever, I can't remember who recommended it. But it was one of those where, you know, we... I don't know, I hated it while I was reading it, but the discussion uh -huh. was so good after when Book Club did, talked about it. That was that was our reaction too. I mean, some of the guys uh, absolutely hated the book. A lot of them loved the book and uh, the passion that that book has for reading and libraries. Um, but it's so funny when, when guys really start complaining about a book like, like this one, and not everybody complains. But they'll start complaining, and I will note, hey, guys, you know, you voted on this. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't my pick. You voted on it. <laughs> so, so do you have to, uh, I mean, there are, like, well-known authors that I don't think are of book club quality. Like, you know, they're fine to, like, read on an airplane. Like, I'm thinking specifically of James Patterson and the book he puts out. Every week he puts out a book. Right. Do you have to shut down those type of authors, or have they learned not to choose them? Well, I've gotten to the point where whatever they vote on and gets gets picked, that's what we'll do. And uh, I told them from the beginning, I said, you know, if you want to read James Patterson, you know, Lee Child, Vince Flynn, those are those are fun reads, but there's just not a lot to talk about. You know, when you're when you're reading a uh, Jack Reacher novel, I mean, how much can you say? Yeah, Reacher kicked this guy's butt. <laughs> how many times can you say that? Because there's, again, those are enjoyable reads, but there's just not a lot to talk about. So if there's something to talk about, then then that's fine. Uh, we did come across one book, and I'm not going to mention the title or the author or the person that picked it. Oh come but, on. <laughs> I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. All this right. may get me in trouble. But it's a popular author that a lot of people would know. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you also that it's an author who writes nonfiction and fiction. And this was a story about uh, the Revolutionary War and specifically about George Washington. And they voted on it. They picked it. And I was reading it and I thought, this, this isn't going to go well. Uh, first of all, again, they picked it. Um, some of the guys look at a lot of reviews before they vote. Some of them don't. But it was really more written on a young adult level. I mean, it was very surfacey, uh, you know, just very surface information. And I really felt bad for the guy that picked it because the night that we discussed it, some of those guys were just brutal oh. uh, uh, of, the, of the book. And... It was one of those situations where I said, okay, look, maybe maybe this isn't the greatest book in the world, but let's see if we can have a good discussion. on it. Let's, let's look at what's good there, and let's talk about that rather than bashing the book. And that's really the only time that has happened. So that's, I mean, in, in years of meeting, how many years have you been meeting so far? Almost 12 years. So, you know, that's pretty an amazing, an, a pretty amazing track record. But our time is up, so um, I, Andy, I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on Book Stew, and uh, your joining us was recommended by your distant cousin, Gigi Shenlujian, who is one of the mavens of our library's annual jewelry sale, and that's where I found out about you, so uh, 
Thanks to Gigi and thanks to you, Andy. This has been a really enjoyable half hour. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me. And, and I'm hoping, hoping that everybody in your neighborhood and mine keeps reading. Excellent recommendation. So, books do viewers and listeners, here's the book once again. It's called Men Don't Read. And it, the, it's also the unlikely story of the Guys Book Club by Andy Wolverton. I hope you'll pick it up and thanks for joining us today. And start a book club, join a book club. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get a lot out of it. Have a good night.